Right, I'm um, a senior finds archaeologist for Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service, and I work on commercial projects. I'm usually working to tight deadlines and tight budgets. My job involves balancing these constraints with the application of appropriate standards and a wish to create data and reports that contribute to a bigger understanding. Generally, I have to keep my head down and keep churning the reports out. And I haven't had the opportunity to work on the sort of game-changing finds that Mark's going to be describing from Must Farm. So you might ask, what has global archaeology got to do with me? As a finds archaeologist, I've always had to be aware of evidence for international contacts and trade. Obviously, the level of imports in Worcestershire isn't as great as you might get in London, say, but, but they are there. Our local Iron Age pottery, up at the top there, is decorated with duck stamps, which belong to a family of Celtic motifs found across Europe. And as a Roman archaeologist specialising in Roman pottery, I regularly deal with imported finds from um, Samian, from Gaul, Amphora, Mortaria, and I have to liaise with colleagues who specialise in these materials. Questions of international trade, demography, migration and cultural exchange are key themes in Roman research and can be reflected in the pottery. And the head pot up at the top yet there, found at York, is thought to be Julia Domna, the Syrian wife of the Emperor Septimus Severus, so one of the earliest Syrian migrants coming to Britain, perhaps. The study group for Roman pottery has done a great deal to encourage international collaboration. Um, we have international contributions to the um, Journal for Roman Pottery Studies, but a key way of achieving this is through online resources. National Roman Fabric Reference Collection, which was created by study group members Roberta Tomba and John Daw, covers all the major wares found in Britain, so it includes a range of imports. This is back online now, and it's available for researchers in Britain, but also across the globe, and provides a model for use elsewhere. Another example of um, a good online resource is the Romanish Germanisches Central Museum Mainz Open Access Database, which provides an excellent example of international collaboration and demonstrates the potential for international research if standardised approaches to recording are applied. The database was created by the International Pegasus Research Group, led by study group member Jeff Dannell, collabor collaborating with Allard Mies and others, and it builds on the many years of work by Brian Hartley and Brenda Dickinson at the University of Leeds. New data are being added daily, and as you can see, it includes finds from across Europe and is being used internationally. So these data, collected from the many individual sites, once combined, can be mapped to explore patterns of international trade and pottery use. So, for example, the least cost transport routes for kiln products. And in some ways, this project is, um, has parallels with the project Carenza is going to be talking about later, where you're looking at data from a lot of small sites and pulling that together to make an internationally important story. The study group for Raymond Pottery has members in Austria, Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium, and has held a number of international conferences, for example in Ghent and Amsterdam where material can be viewed, strategic policies discussed, and ideas exchanged, sometimes over gin. Um, and I think any, anybody who comes to the CIFA conference will know that you get something from going to the papers, but actually an awful lot of what you achieve is done in between over tea and at meals and in the social sessions in the evening. Study group members also speak at other international conferences, for example, SVECAG, the Société Française d'Études de la Ceramique Antique en Gaulle, and the Medieval Pottery Research Group also has held international conferences. For example, Portugal, Italy and Germany has international members and collaborates internationally. <laughs> so I think all, all pottery specialists linked into these groups have international contacts and are thinking about international aspects of their work. There can, of course, be issues with the costs of attending international conferences. There's certainly issues if you're trying to keep up with the number... <coughs> Sorry, a number of period specialisms, but that's the case even when conferences are held in Britain. And it is, impossible, it is possible to share information without attending expensive conferences. And this poster um, 
was produced with Alison Heek from Chester and illustrated by Laura Templeton. It was made to publicise some unusual fav ovens that were found in Worcester and Chester. We were hoping to track down some parallels. So the poster was shown at RAC and an international Limes conference, and it resulted in a number of useful international contacts and discussions. <coughs> So just, just by getting the information out there, you can make contacts with people in other countries and see how your material fits into the bigger picture. <coughs> Obviously, standards and standardisation are important for big data studies, whether within Britain, as on the Roman Rural Settlement Project, or for international research, such as the Samian database that I mentioned earlier. The three British period pottery groups have collaborated to produce guidance and while this is intended for British use, we'd be very happy for it to be used elsewhere and adapted as needed. Um, it's accessible online through academia and through the three pottery group websites. It's being accessed quite widely through academia, though mainly by individual researchers. And it seems to be a very big hit in Slovenia. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> Statistics from the Medieval Pottery Research Group website show that while the majority of views have been in the UK, a significant number were from the USA, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, Belgium, Romania, Germany, Scandinavian countries and Ireland. Another project concerned with standards and standardisation of data was the Big Data on the Roman Table project. This was an 18-month AHRC funded network <coughs> led by Professor Penelope Allison of the University of Leicester and Dr Martin Pitts, the University of Exeter. This was attended by specialists from the UK, Ireland, Austria, Italy, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Croatia, Spain, Canada and France. This aimed to develop innovative approaches to the analysis of big data across the Roman Empire. to take artefact specialists out of the comfort zones of their current analytical approaches and instigate dialogue amongst academic, government and commercial organisations. The project provided a forum to discuss drafts of the pottery standards at an international level. As a result, my attendance was financially supported by the project and I couldn't have attended otherwise. And that, that's a key issue in international collaborations, is actually funding for achieving that. The project surveyed participants about the use of standards and guidelines before the joint standards were published. Representatives from Luxembourg, Croatia, Netherlands and Austria reported that no relevant standards and guidelines existed. Worryingly, one respondent from the UK also said no prescribed standards applied. More encouragingly, all the respondents who said national, regional and institutional standards were from the UK. This was only a small study. <coughs> Perhaps this is something that the um, CIFA Fines um, group and the International Practice Group could collaborate on developing. One of the organisers, Sarah Colley, commented that the project supported collaboration between individuals, but this can only occur where individuals have motivation and resources. We're all chasing money. She also noted some of the challenges with languages the Roman Empire covers many countries, and even more countries have scholars, scholars interested in studying it. I haven't got time to even begin to talk about research into medieval and post-medieval international trade, partially coming into Britain, going out of Britain. <coughs> Just a quick Google search. About who knew that there were English ceramics incorporated in the Water Run Temple in Bangkok? There's just so much um, international trade and exchange of fines. <coughs> I want to end by just bowling one last ball into the debate. In 2003, I organised a session on ethnic participation and British archaeology in the 21st century. Looking around the conference, I don't see that much has changed in the profile of the profession. But artefacts provide so much tangible evidence for the interaction of different cultures. How can we use them to engage more diversely? Why hasn't this situation changed? And perhaps that's something for the uh, CIFA Equality and Diversity Group to pick up on next year. OK, thank you. Thank you, Jane.
Right. Uh, my background um, was in uh, commercial archaeology as a pottery specialist. So much of what Jane has been talking about um, are the kinds of themes uh, that I would normally be talking to you about uh, today. Um, when we were putting this session together, Jane uh, suggested that I might want to give a university-based view. And inevitably, in doing so, what I'm going, going to be doing is, to some extent, reflecting broad trends within the university sector, but also, to some extent, reflecting, I suppose, my personal experience, particularly um, as an admissions tutor. So you, you're not going to get the view on the university sector, you're going to get a view. And uh, I was trying to think more broadly about how we uh, foster these uh, cultures of collaboration. Um, now, on the outside of the tin, uh, I guess universities in the UK are all about international research. Uh, the great and the good here, we've got um, Professor Sir David Greedaway and Acting Director Dr Tim Bradshaw of the Russell Group saying that Russell Group universities, of which of course Newcastle is one, are international institutions with a global reputation for the quality of our teaching, research and collaborative relationships. And of course for those of you who are um, plugged into the excitement that is UK academia, you'll know all about the joys of the REF. And uh, in REF terms, uh, anything less than a four star uh, or a three-star really isn't uh, terribly important. And you'll see that the key caveats, the key criteria here, are about international excellence, world-leading. And the easiest way, we're told, to do internationally important research is to do it internationally, um, which actually brings all kinds of interesting problems for trying to work in the UK. Anyway, that's a different story for another day. Um, Essentially, we're all about this. This is what we're meant to be all about. And at one level, the future is kind of bright. We've just seen lots of interesting projects that are built on long-standing international collaborations. And we have projects that have successfully uh, gained funding and have quite a big pan-European uh, scale to them. So here we've got some dots on a map from the Coid Hordes of the Roman Empire project being run by Oxford. Um, you know, we're told that uh, these kinds of projects can be successful. They do attract funding um, if framed in the right way. If anybody can tell me what the right way to frame one of these applications is, I'd be quite keen to learn. Uh, and it, they also display the willingness of international collaborators to work with us. And it's a slightly different kind of project, more bottom-up, I suppose, rather than top-down. It's the Artifacts Online Encyclopedia um, being run in France. But at the same time, I think from the university's perspective, or well, from the university sector's perspective, there are some significant clouds on our horizon. We're not in the Brexit session, which I think is tomorrow, but I think when we're thinking about international collaboration, we need to consider the impacts of some of these things. So the university sector, uh, particularly in the humanities, is very worried about what's going to happen to EU funding for research. We're concerned about the freedom of movement of researchers. Um, and perhaps most, not, I don't know, most importantly is perhaps the wrong way to put it, but at a grassroots level, um, access to things like the Erasmus scheme. How do we build tomorrow's international collaborations if our students um, cannot go and spend time in other places? And we've got a series of old problems that we're all probably uh, well aware of. Um, I think it was in The Guardian I was reading recently that of 18 to 25 year olds, only 30% of people uh, can speak a foreign language in the UK at anything more than a childlike level. Um, and that, that is actually quite a, it's quite a difficult hurdle, I think, for us as fine specialists. If you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to study the distribution of whatever it is, pottery, brooches, um, across large regions, uh, you are going inevitably to be uh, having to work in different languages. And um, I suspect that my experience of asking students to read things in French or German or Spanish, uh, let alone anything more exotic, um, will be echoed by anybody else who works in academia, and that students tend to feel that their human rights are being violated. Uh, you know, these, these are strategic problems, and 
Again, connecting with that, the kinds of fees that are being charged now, we are no longer an economic option for some of our international partners to send their students to us. You, know, you can do an undergraduate degree in the States for the equivalent of £9,000 a year. So what does this mean for the future? I don't know. Um, these are all big existential worries, right? I, I don't know what the solutions to these are. They're not for us to... You know, we're not really capable of changing these things, are we? Although I suppose we'll get a chance... Uh, on the 8th of June. Anyway, just to end with some shiny things, because this is about fines, um, I've been working with Martin Hennig looking at an obscure kind of late Roman finger ring uh, called the Brancaster ring. They're quite pretty things. Um, and uh, Catherine Johns defined the type back in the late 90s. And uh, they've always been seen as a British phenomenon. Um, but it strikes me, actually, that they are part of a wider late antique world. And if you look across the channel, if you read the French German scholarship, you do find things that are broadly comparable. So there's this ring from Poitiers, uh, these Merovingian rings, uh, this one from France, very similar to the rings we have in Britain. And in terms of international collaboration, I was terribly heartened to see that in the south of France, people had started identifying rings as being of the Brancaster type. And I thought that was tremendous and brilliant. Um, until I discovered that one of them looked like this. And there's the dis description. <coughs> so um, we still have a little way to go. I know that this, is, this is just a bit of grumpiness, I suppose, on my part. Um, the Brancaster ring is an all-metal, square-bezeled finger ring. There are plenty of them in Britain. Uh, in the south of France, we have similar square-bezeled metal finger rings. But this is... Uh, here we have Chinese whispers, and here we have the Brancaster ring reinvented by a French specialist as having a stone bezel of green steatite uh, of square form. Um, so... International collaborations, we've got lots of them. They're really good. There's potential to continue to have them. There are challenges, but it, we still, at this grassroots level, fundamentally, I think, have quite a lot of work to do. And I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges for us, is how do we, uh, how do we instill this at a grassroots level among our colleagues and uh, the next generation of researchers and scholars. Okay, so thank you. I've said my piece. Thank you. Okay. Thank Thanks, James. Okay. Hi there, I'm Kat Baxter. I'm curator of archaeology for Leeds Museums and Galleries, but I'm here with my SMA hat on today as the secretary for the Society for Museum Archaeology. And I just want to really, really briefly touch on um, some of the ways in which museums work in a global context and provide a bit of context for the later papers in this session. But I've got less than 10 minutes, so I'll only be touching on a few of these very major themes. Um, it's by no means exhaustive. And just to echo what James said, this is really from my own personal perspective. So who are we, the Society for Museum Archaeology? Well, we are the subject specialist network for archaeology in the UK. Um, we promote museum involvement in archaeology, greater public understanding of archaeology, and we really campaign for museums being the guardians of the nation's heritage and the appropriate place for all archaeological material to be deposited and interpreted. And as part of this, we work on some really um, fantastic national projects. For example, at the moment, we are in year two of a three-year project with, uh, funded by Historic England on gathering data from museums across England on um, the capacity to take archaeological archives and of archaeological expertise in museums. And I really recommend going to the Society for Museum Archaeology website and looking at the first year report because there's some really interesting statistics in that report. Um, for example, 14, only 49.5% of respondents of museums with archaeology collections actually have 
any staff with any archaeological expertise. So it's a really, really interesting um, data set. So generally in, the, in museums then, where there are problems of potentially the decline of expertise in museums and lack of resources, you might think that international working wasn't exactly high up on the agenda. But actually after last year's conference, our SMA conference, which had the title A World of Archaeology from Local to Global, we actually celebrated a lot of the ways in which we did work in a more um, global way across international boundaries. So how are museums, do we fit into this sort of global profession? Well, one of the most obvious ones is that museum collections are often international, certainly in um, big sort of metropolitan museums. We're not going to play and name the country right now, but we can do it in the break. Um, so in my own experience, working for Leeds Museums and Galleries, as well as dealing with local archaeology, for example, some of the other collections that I look after um, and, and curate are what you would expect, ancient Greek, ancient Roman, ancient Egyptian collections, but also smaller collections from the Near East, from, from India, from North America. And then in the World Cultures Department, so not in archaeology, there are archaeological collections from other parts of the world, Africa, China, South America. So we're the guardians of these very global collections, and not just the guardians, but the voice of these collections. We are there to interpret these collections and get people excited about what we have and work with communities, um, local and, and global. But these collections can also be challenging because, let's face it, much of this overseas material was collected in the 19th and early 20th century by... Um, by collectors with more of a, a colonial mindset. And we have to be very transparent about how a lot of these collections are in, are in our museums. Today, we don't collect the way we used to. And we have um, a lot of ethical considerations in terms of international collecting. We sign up to the Museums Association Code of Ethics, which um, clearly states that we must reject working with any items if there is any suspicion that they were wrongfully taken during a time of conflict, etc. And we sign up to things like the UNESCO Convention of 1970, and we practice due diligence, which means we all do everything in our power, that all that is reasonable to research any object before we work with it, before we borrow it, acquire it, particularly if it's from overseas. So we're very um, on the ball with, with ethics. And obviously with ethics, I don't know what's happened there, um, with ethics, there are also obviously very high profile claims for repatriation, and repatriation is the theme of one of the papers later in the session. Um, the two up here are obviously two of the most high profile claims for repatriation of, of archaeological collections, um, the so-called Elgin Marbles in the British Museum and the bust of Queen Nefertiti, and these obviously get a lot of national press. So museums um, today do face a lot of, of these sort of international ethical dilemmas um, because of our sort of colonial past and the way things have been collected. And it's really important for us to be transparent in this regard. Uh, one of the ways in which museums have, have done a lot of fa fabulous things with our collections is through research and, and exhibition partnerships. And Brian... Um, and Carenza will both be sort of talking more about this in their papers later in the session. So working with different institutions around the world, so this is just an example from Leeds City Museum where we have a fabulous archive of Roman material from a site called Lanuvium, so 30 kilometres from Rome, collected in the 1860s, brought back to the UK, and the archive was split between Leeds Museums and Galleries and the British Museum. And in this partnership, the Capitoline Museum in Rome actually borrowed the material from ourselves and the British Museum and reunited these fantastic marbles in Rome for the first time since they were sort of rediscovered in the 19th century. And that was a really wonderful partnership to work on. World Heritage Sites, I'll just touch on um, sites of significance, global significance, as listed by UNESCO. Um, Francis McIntosh will be talking about collaborations and Hadrian's Wall later in, uh, in the session. But um, Stonehenge here obviously celebrated 30 years of World Heritage Site status last year. 
So it's another way of reaching global audiences and having sites and museums of international significance. And finally, on my real sort of whistle-stop tour, um, I wanted to mention, and something that really came out of our conference, the SMA conference last year, is reaching a, a global audience. And by global audience, I mean audiences around the world, but also our local, very diverse communities. We have these fantastic, really diverse collections and museums. And one way to sort of get our collections out there is to try and get everything online. Now, this is our, the database that we use at Leeds and some of our collections pages, but we don't have all our collections online yet. And in a way, this is sort of a, a quick win where people can find what you have. If people can't find what you have in your museum, um, if people can't access the collection and aren't using the collection, then there's the question of why do we have it at all? It's our responsibility to make our collections as globally accessible as possible. And I know that museums across the country are, are constantly sort of working on this backlog and trying to get collections out there to increase engagement and research on our collections. Thank you.